Every now and then, I'm reminded of just how far we have to go. Not just in the nation, but in the church here in GB. There are moments when I'm reminded of just how far we have to go. Because it's easy to live with your head somewhat on the other side of the Atlantic on this issue, the issue of the slaughter of unborn children. Of course, it's it's happening all over the world, but right now um, in the States, it's a live issue politically. It's one of the main defining issues in the election, and people are talking about it. It's getting a lot of airtime. And indeed, I've been spending a bit of time recently uh, in the debate between immediatism and incrementalism, which is very live in the States and, and will no doubt become live here. And indeed, we're going to start addressing it on this podcast. We're going to uh, open it up, uh, God willing, next week, probably. Uh, it is an important issue and it will become more and more important uh, for the pro-life movement as it develops here. But in a sense, relatively speaking, it's a luxury. It's a luxury to be talking about the differences between immediatism and incrementalism. I would love for that to be the actual live debate going on here today um, because we're nowhere near that. The question uh, that's, that's troubling the church is not a question of tactics, it's not methods, it's not, well, should we go down the incremental route, should we go down the immediatist route? The question that's troubling the church is not a question of how, but in fact, it's a question of whether. Should we fight abortion at all? One of the rude awakenings to which I was referring at the beginning uh, there w was uh, on the Building Jerusalem podcast. Some of you listened to that recently when two pastors uh, pondered aloud uh, whether we should, as they put it, impose our morality on the culture. In other words, and in fact, they weren't even just pondering aloud. They were saying we shouldn't. It was quite clear in the way they were speaking that that's that's not the business of the church. We shouldn't be trying to influence the morality of the culture because somehow that's that's wrong. That's expecting Christians to live as non-Christians. We we should stay out of influencing legislation and culture, um, and we'll just let BPAS impose its morality on the babies, its morality of death and destruction. We'll just let. The, the Labour Party or the Lib Dems or the Greens or whoever uh, it is who's trying to advance an abortion agenda, we'll let them impose their morality, their wicked morality. But, you know, heaven forbid that we Christians who have the word of God and truth and justice and righteousness uh, as our belt, you know, heaven forbid we should get involved and actually try and influence the culture towards defending innocent life, stopping child abuse. So, so you see that the problem is not just a, a question of tactics, how we should fight abortion, it's whether we should fight abortion. But the problem goes even deeper than that. It's not even a question of whether. It's, it's not as though we're actually uh, all agreed, even notionally, even doctrinally, on the issue of abortion itself. It would be one thing if we were all crystal clear on our theology uh, and then it was a question of, OK, to what extent do we respond as the church and so on? But we're not even there. And this was another such occasion where there was that rude awakening uh, and that reminder of just how far we have to go here in GB. And I'm not saying this to uh, depress you. Um, I'm, I'm saying this because we need to be praying. We need to be alert. We need to be clear about the road ahead of us and just how far we do have to go. Uh, we need to be strategic. We need to understand what's before us. Uh, we really do need to pray for each other. Please pray for me. Please pray for our team. Please pray for the church. Pray for pastors. Because uh, what I want to talk to you about today is really more uh, doctrinal. It's about the kind of basic ethics, really, um, of abortion. Now, many of you will feel, perhaps, uh, I know all this already. Maybe you do. I hope, I hope you do. Um, I'll introduce it in just a second in more detail. Um, but but if you do already, and I trust many of our listeners do already know this stuff, can I encourage you, I think as Rico Tice puts it, uh, to see yourself not as a reservoir, but a river. Think, who can you pass this on to, whether that's literally forwarding this podcast or having a conversation 
with your pastor or whatever it might be because there is so much confusion over this area that I'm going to um, unpack for us in just a moment. So much confusion within churches that would see themselves as very orthodox, evangelical, even pro-life. Uh, and, and I'm going to give you two examples of where pro-life people have repeated this error and spread this confusion. So um, stick around just a minute longer and uh, and if nothing else, think who can you forward this on to if all of this is basic to you, as I hope it is, but I fear it isn't for many of us. So the, the, the occasion I want to focus on today um, is, is this. I, I was reading the editorial uh, column within a broadly conservative evangelical publication called Evangelicals Now here in uh, Great Britain, the UK. And this uh, publication is, I'm happy to say, and I'm thankful to say, very much pro-life in that it talks about abortion regularly, gives it a lot of airtime. Um, they've been generous to us um, in, in allowing us to publish things uh, from time to time. Uh, and it's, it's clear there is a concern. There's a real genuine concern for the unborn child. Indeed, I'll quote from, from the, this recent editorial, the slaughter of so many millions of unborn children in the West in the last few decades is one of the great blind spots of our decaying culture. Absolutely it is, and not just in the West, in the East and in the global South, uh, all over the world. And our hearts do grieve at this. And I think there is genuine concern, of course, um, displayed here by, by the, the editorial comment. And I am grateful that this issue that this um, issue is given so much airtime in, in this particular publication. If churches gave it half the attention, we'd be in a different place. But there was a, a kind of offhand parenthetical comment um, within this short editorial piece that raised my eyebrows and again reminded me of just how far we have to go and I think it shows there is genuine confusion even amongst well-meaning people who really would see themselves as pro-life and and really are but just haven't quite frankly thought it th through yet fully and this is the comment of course there are always situations for example rape incest and imminent danger to a mother's life where we cannot be so black and white but they should not distract us from the widest tragedy where no such contingencies apply and and um, again this is representative of what a lot of conservative evangelicals think um, John Stevens the national director of the FIEC uh, said in a blog a couple of years back um, that we we will be you know evangelicals will be less sure when it comes to and then he lists cases like this the hard cases the extreme cases whatever you want to call them and suggests that people can be broadly pro-life and and firmly against sort of elective abortion when it comes to hard cases we can't be so sure and indeed uh, he went on to say and you know don't be so dogmatic the, these are nuances that we need to wrestle with within evangelicalism to which I tried to reply these aren't nuances these are human beings uh, unfortunately that conversation hasn't gone any further but here it is in EM there are always these situations now that that, that final uh, comment they should not distract us from the wider tragedy at a statistical and sort of pragmatic even a, a rhetorical level um, insofar as it goes that comment is valid um, all the hard cases taken together account for only about 2% in this country, and they certainly shouldn't be used uh, as a cover for the other 98%, where the motive for abortion is much more straightforwardly. The baby isn't wanted. There's no medical issue. There's no sexual crime. Essentially, it's an unwanted child. So, so in that sense, they shouldn't distract us. That's true. Um and in terms of campaigning and apologetics, conversations on the streets, there is wisdom, I believe, in not allowing those exceptional cases to dominate the conversation. And I think we've we've looked at that elsewhere uh, on this podcast. You can go back and look at that 
uh, in terms of apologetics and so on. So yes, insofar as it goes, that's right. They shouldn't distract us. However, I'm concerned that many evangelicals, even well-meaning, um, self-professedly pro-life evangelicals, many of them are actually unclear within their own hearts and minds on the morality of the hard cases themselves. And uh, we need to get clear on this. Because yes, it's only 2%, but 2% still accounts for thousands of children killed in our nation alone every year. More than knife crime ever kills, more than poverty, more than COVID-19, more than racism or climate change or whatever else we yield our attention and even our pulpits to so enthusiastically. So it matters for those children, thousands of them, thousands of children. Okay, let's not dismiss the 2%. So we're not splitting hairs here. These are these are real lives. But, but perhaps even more than that, there is a moral urgency and a kind of theological, intellectual, ethical urgency to getting clarity on these hard cases because it's a bit like if you don't get the foundations of a building right, even a small part of the foundations of a building right, the, the rest isn't going to go well. Because if we can't be sure, if we're not utterly clear in our hearts and minds as pro-lifers, as Christians, that all lives matter from fertilization, regardless of size, regardless of genetic strength, regardless of circumstances, regardless of sex, regardless of ethnicity, whatever, if we can't be sure that all lives matter, no exceptions, then it is not, after all, the sanctity of life itself that we value. But rather, what we value are the various qualities that we judge make life worth living. In other words, we are actually hedonists or utilitarians. We're not thinking Christianly. Even if we think most lives are worth living and worth protecting, that would only be an accident of statistics, not because we're crystal clear on the word of God and on what it means to be made in the image of God and that we are committed to and understand the doctrine that all lives are made in the image of God and are equally precious in his sight. If we can't be sure that all lives matter, the truth is we don't believe life matters. We only believe some lives matter because of certain contingencies. And that simply won't do. We cannot lead our nation in moral clarity, in Christian thinking, in righteous just thinking. We cannot lead our nation. We cannot advocate effectively for the unborn child if we're not even clear on ourselves that all lives matter. And it's always wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human being. It's always wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human being. This really matters. And, and so, yes, you can say, oh, it's just 2%. But in another sense, this is right at the the very root of the issue, if we're not clear on the so-called hard cases, we're not clear on the issue of abortion at all. We're not clear on the value of the unborn child. By way of analogy, it would be no good to say we're strongly against racism and we're deeply disturbed by racism. And all of us would be against, you know, racism at will. We're, we're horrified by that. However, in the case of racism against, to pick an arbitrary example, Chinese people, well, we can't be so hard and fast. Evangelicals will differ there. And those are nuances we need to conjure with. Um, but that shouldn't distract us from the fact that we're all broadly against racism. We all generally hate it. You know, we'd love to see an end to racism. It's just racism against Chinese people where we're not so clear. To make this exception would, of course, be wrong. Wrong in itself because it's still racism against a certain ethnicity, but also wrong because it threatens to bring down the whole house, house of cards. If we can make one exception, why not another? It shows we're not really against racism. So, 
I hope you're with me so far, and I hope you agree it is important to get this clear. And again, for many of you, it might already be, if that's the case. Maybe take in what I'm going to say in case it's a helpful way for you to make this issue clearer for other people. Because uh, as I see it, much of the confusion, perhaps most of the confusion, stems from the fact that all the so-called hard cases are in fact just lumped together as one. When in fact they relate to very different situations with very different attempted moral justifications attached to those situations. There's a very different set of reasoning that comes with each. And uh, when we just rush them through as one, the hard cases, uh, we, we're not really giving ourselves the chance to understand each scenario separately and on its own merits. We can't just assume these are all equally valid or valid in the same way or have the same rules applied. So, uh, but by, by way of um, analogy, uh, our culture expects us to embrace LGBTQI a two plus and so on inclusivity notwithstanding the fact that very few of us have any idea what the letters beyond the first few actually stand for um but perhaps more to the point the fact that some of these letters stand in direct opposition to one another what do the l's and the g's really think about the t's we should beware the dangers of lumping together that kind of categorization that sort of thoughtless it's like anti-categorization actually because it's just it's just lumping everything together regardless of whether it it actually belongs in the same class so we need to be very careful uh in this case to separate out so to separate out each of the hard cases and treat them independently of one another okay so that's what we're going to do uh for the rest of this episode we're going to separate out the hard cases and treat them independently of one another on their own merits and I hope this will bring a bit more clarity and help us to see why they shouldn't be lumped together and they shouldn't just be um, accepted as some kind of grey area where we can't be so sure. So there are essentially uh, four hard cases that are commonly cited. Uh, rape, incest, extreme fetal abnormality, for example where the baby's not expected to survive very long or maybe not have a good so-called quality of life and then there's the life of the mother okay so rape incest fetal abnormality and life of the mother so firstly then uh, rape and we have done a whole episode on this um but here's something of a reminder of course of course we condemn all sexual crime uh, perpetrators should be brought to justice and victims should be given every possible support and it is a travesty how seldom rape for example is successfully prosecuted in this country it's a scandal how light uh, the prison sentences are that is a scandal and victims should be given every possible support however we must reject the idea that supporting a woman who has become the victim of a sexual crime can ever take the form of intentionally killing her unborn child. Where did we get that idea from? How did we get to a point where we believed the way to support a mother, whatever the circumstances, is to break entry into her womb and to kill her unborn child? M morally, that protests itself when you think about it. Um, the data protests it and we're not going to go into that here but you can go look on our YouTube channel um, there's an excellent talk by Callum Miller on these things uh, looking at a lot of the data demonstrating um, empirically this is not the way to support a mother even in that awful situation so, so we deny that that can ever be the way to support her we deny it wipes away the first trauma. We deny that it helps towards true healing. But even if it could, even if it could be argued that it did help the mother in some way, and that we deny, but even if it could be argued, 
that say her psychological suffering could be alleviated by killing her unborn child, by adding another trauma and another victim. It can never be morally justifiable to intentionally kill one innocent human being in, attempt, in an attempt to alleviate the psychological suffering of another innocent human being, whatever the circumstances. One is reminded of the biblical principle, the soul who sins is the soul that shall die. Ezekiel 18.20, the son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. Children shouldn't be put to death for the crimes of their parents. The baby's done nothing wrong. The baby should not be put to death for the sin of his or her father. Biblically, this is actually very clear. It's very black and white. We don't kill children because of what their parents do. That's clear. Now, since biblically it's very clear we don't kill children for the sins of their parents, why is it so unclear within evangelicalism? Why are we so hazy on the issue of rape? Well, partly the reason is we, we've been pressed into accepting the world's definition of compassion. We've been we, we we've given the world terminology like compassion and love. These are these are Christian ideas. We've given the world these terms, and then the world has has turned them around, repackaged them, and sent them back to us and told us what it looks like for us to be good Christians. We need to be compassionate. We need to be non-judgmental. We need to be unconditional. And we've been led to believe that it would be unloving towards the poor mother um, who has been the victim of a, an awful crime, as she has been. We've been led to believe it lacks compassion to not kill her baby. Many of us have believed it's harsh, it's unloving, it's judgmental, it's narrow, it's being stubborn and inflexible to not kill her baby or to not allow someone else to kill her baby. We've allowed the idea of compassion to be so distorted. Many of us genuinely think that. So we've been twisted around on what we think compassion is and what our job is as Christians, what we're meant to show. But what it also shows is because the, the welfare of the baby is entirely left out of the picture, I mean, no one can argue that killing a baby is, is the way to love a baby. Um, it shows that the unborn child has been dehumanised in our eyes. Our moral confusion in the case of rape is evidence that we still don't fully grasp the humanity and preciousness of the child in the womb. Because who, who argues that toddlers should be killed for the sexual crimes of their fathers? Who, who claims we should we should go back and, and just, as soon as we find out that some, that some child was was conceived in rape, we find out age five, ten, whatever, we put them to death because of what their father did. No one says that. And yet when the child is still in the womb, many of us are quite comfortable with saying that. Or we'll say we can't be so sure, can't be so black and white, mustn't be too dogmatic. Biblically, it is black and white. We don't kill children for the sins of their parents. We follow the world in allowing size or location or level of development to dictate a child's value. This is totally foreign to biblical morality. And so the case of rape, it is an extreme situation. It's a heartbreaking situation and it's emotionally fraught. And when it's brought up in, uh, whether it's on the streets or in a media interview or whatever it might be, as it so frequently is, it's brought out um, quite disingenuously often as a sort of trump card and the goal is to make us seem like the ones who have no compassion we don't care we don't understand and many of us are just stunned into acceptance or confusion by the, the sort of emotional weighting of this issue it is extreme but to put it the other way it's just extreme it's just an extreme version of abortion for social reasons it's just an extreme version of we claim this would be better for the mother's mental health for example and therefore we're going to kill the baby we don't kill babies to make adults feel better no matter how grave the situation that is morally wrong we need to offer every form of help that we can 
but we don't kill babies to make adults feel better no matter what's happened and that's not trivializing the trauma it's not saying it doesn't matter it's not saying it was okay that has happened the question now is what is the right thing to do now and it is never um, the the noble thing to go and cause suffering indeed death to another innocent human being and claim that that is the way to help the first innocent victim that's not how we deal with trauma and crime we don't put innocent children to death because of the sins of their parents so that's something on rape secondly incest now um, come to think of it i don't think i've ever actually heard anyone spell out the logic of this you know, why is it precisely a child should be put to death if their uh, parents are closely related I don't, I don't think I've ever actually heard anyone spell that out, but I can guess that the justification would be either because incest is often also a horrific sexual crime, in which case um, all of the above um, applies. That it's essentially, it's the same kind of reasoning as, as abortion in the case of rape. Or uh, it's because incest significantly increases the likelihood of genetic abnormality or poor so-called quality of life in the child, in which case... Um, the treatment below uh, applies what I'm about to go on to, to talk about um, fetal abnormality so I don't think incest really is a class of its own in a sense um, in terms of the moral reasoning it's either akin to rape or it's akin to fetal abnormality so let's move on then to the third uh, scenario fetal abnormality now as many of you know in this country abortion is permitted up till birth for any kind of perceived abnormality great or small so our our culture clearly thinks it is easier to justify killing a baby if it's um if it's got any kind of uh, abnormality um down syndrome is probably the highest profile example hundreds of babies each year are killed for having down syndrome and indeed most evangelicals do condemn this um, however with more extreme cases of fetal abnormality perhaps where so-called quality of life and i think really this is a phrase we should be very wary of uh, we shouldn't use this phrase uncritically um, it's actually quite a gross phrase to speak of quality of life um, it uh, really betrays our worldliness when we use it uncritically as if we uh, agree with certain assumptions about what makes life worth living and good uh, valuable um, and lives that are just not as good uh, of course some lives involve incredible suffering and they're very 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 hard but the moment we start talking about um, quality of life we we can quickly find ourselves um, sounding and, and thinking and deciding like hedonists um, and uh, and actually well we've got no space to look at that whole area in this episode but when we look at what the bible has to say about suffering um it's really not um it doesn't really do to say that um a life that has more suffering is is less worthwhile so we need to be careful with phrases like 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 quality of life and so on but where so-called quality of life is um compromised where the baby is not expected to survive long after birth here again pro-life evangelicals lose clarity they say we can't be so black and white and indeed we hear stories of professing christians who attempted uh, to have their unborn children killed in these scenarios and, and some do so once again what we're seeing here is uh, just how far the dehumanization of the baby in the womb has gone not talking about the church the, the culture's blind spot here talking about the church's blind spot here because again who would ever argue that if a five-year-old is very poorly with the doctors believing he only has a, a year left to live for example who would argue we should apply a torturous lethal injection of potassium chloride to his heart and that's what they do to children in the womb 
in late-term late so-called abortions, often without anaesthetic. Who would argue we should do that to a five-year-old uh, if he was very, very poorly or quality of life isn't too good? Or, well, Of course, the shocking thing is with the, the current euthanasia debate, some people would argue that, perhaps. Some, perhaps some would. A five-year-old's having a hard time or he hasn't been given long to live. Well, let's just put him to death now. Perhaps some would argue that. But people in the church generally won't. And yet this is precisely what we are entertaining or advocating in the case of abortion for fatal fetal abnormality or extreme fetal abnormality. And, and, and perhaps actually this is a case in point. How can we, and we're not, we are not being really any use as the church. And I hold my hands up. Uh, I've, I've not done a great deal on this side of things. Um, how can the church be a useful voice in the euthanasia debate? We can't be because we don't have the moral clarity. Why? Because we've entertained the idea that it's okay essentially to euthanize children in the womb. We've believed in mercy killings. We've, we've taken the Nazi doctrine of lives unworthy of life, lives not worth living. We've accepted that in some cases in the womb. We've, we've imbibed that from the culture. And so when it comes to a crisis point with euthanasia being debated in Parliament, where are the Christians? Well, we're nowhere because we, we never got our thinking straight when they were doing it in the womb. Indeed, you can find Church of England bishops in the 1960s and, and 70s um, saying that they found the idea of children being allowed to live with certain conditions horrifying and dehumanising. And they were active advocates for killing them in the womb. So, so it does matter what we think about the extreme cases, the hard cases, the exceptional cases. It really matters because it shows whether or not we understand this at all. Whether we understand about the sanctity of life at all. And therefore whether we can be of any use whatsoever uh, in a debate on euthanasia. Or um, more broadly on, on abortion itself or on life issues. We can't be. In fact... It's not just that we're useless, we often end up fighting on the wrong side. That's what happened in the 60s. You can go back and see how the, the Church of England drafted the Abortion Act. And David Steele thanked them. The Church wasn't clear on abortion in the 60s. And we're still not really clear. We're, we're maybe a bit clearer than we were, but we're still not clear. And perhaps worse still, we think we're clear. We think it's okay to say, let's not be too black and white on these, these cases. We think that's okay. We think we can still call ourselves uh, concerned pro-lifers. We need to get this straight. Any child in the womb, out of the womb, should be given the best care possible, even if that care is only palliative. Prognoses are often wrong, of course, but even if we assume they're somewhat correct, the answer is not to kill the child. The answer is to care for the child, to cherish every moment with the child. That's the dignifying thing to do. To kill in an attempt to alleviate suffering is foreign to biblical morality. That's hedonism. Plenty of cultures do that. Christian culture does not. It's interesting that in, in 2 Samuel chapter 1, the attempted justification of the Amalekite who killed Saul when he was in the, the fight, he, he, had, he had been wounded, he was... He said he was going to die, of course, no one ever knows, but it looks like he was dying, and of course he was in pain, uh, and he wanted to be finished off. Um, and the Amalekite did, as he was bidden to do, and uh, his justification was, because I knew that after he had fallen, he could not survive. And of course, um, I think it can be assumed that he was attempting to alleviate Saul's suffering. So it's, you know, well, he was going to die anyway, and this sort of alleviated his suffering. And many Christians today would say, well, yeah, that's a compassionate thing to do. But in 2 Samuel chapter 1, it was no defence. David pronounced judgment against him. Your own mouth testified against you when you said, I killed the Lord's anointed. Shedding of innocent blood is shedding of innocent blood. We can't sugarcoat it. We can't redefine it. We can't justify it away. The final word on the Amalekite was, he killed the Lord's anointed. He shouldn't have done it. And whether we say we're killing to alleviate the mother's suffering, whether we say we're killing to alleviate the child's suffering, it's killing. 
is killing, is intentionally killing an innocent human being. And it's foreign to biblical morality. So the three we've looked at so far, uh, rape, incest, fetal abnormality, uh, are they are they really so grey? Or are they in fact black and white, biblically? Now, uh, again, I want to, um, I want to acknowledge the fact that, again, so much of the confusion comes because these extreme cases are all lumped together, which is like a stun tactic to stop us thinking through each one carefully. And so uh, I get that, um, but we have to separate them out because the fourth one, the life of the mother, is a very different situation and it has to be treated in a very different way. The, the, the moral scenario here is totally different from the first three we've just talked through. The first three essentially are um, abortion for social reasons. Might be extreme social reasons, but they're abortion for social reasons. They're abortion for so-called mental health. They're abortions for, uh, indeed, eugenic reasons, um, hedonistic reasons, utilitarian reasons. There are various justifications for intentionally killing an innocent human being in the womb. But we must be clear that when there's a, a, a life threatening emergency situation in pregnancy or in delivery or whatever what's going on there is a totally different situation and this is what we're not seeing because they're all lumped together and maybe this is where the confusion comes maybe this is why people say we can't see black and white because they can't they're not thinking about these uh, cases separately from one another which is what we must do we have to be so clear that what we're talking about here in in the case of an emergency situation where there's an intervention whose intention is to save as many lives as possible. This intervention is not designed to take innocent life. It is designed to save lives as much as possible. Here we are dealing with, when it doesn't work out that both lives are saved, we're dealing with the inevitable, unwanted and tragic loss of a human life, not the deliberate ending of a human life. And morally, this is very different very different. When the attempt is to save both mother and child, but one of them is lost, that is a world away from intentionally killing one of them. In some cases, tragically, uh, the mother may be saved and the baby is not. In other situations, it may, may be the other way around. Emergency delivery, the baby is saved, but the mother is not. When the intention, honestly, is starting with the assumption that the, the baby and mother are equally precious, their lives are just as worth um, worthy as, as the other, the others. So if that's our assumption, both lives matter, absolutely. And the intent is to save as many lives as possible. It's a different situation. Now I quote from um, the Life Affirmation website, which somewhat echoes something known as the Dublin Declaration, uh, which says this, it is never medically necessary intentionally to end the life of a baby in the womb, that's abortion, intentionally ending the life of a baby in the womb, and the word intentionally is important, it's never medically necessary intentionally to end the life of a baby in the womb to save the life of the mother. It may be medically necessary to deliver the baby prematurely in an emergency to save the mother's life, after delivery, every reasonable effort should be made to sustain and enhance the life of the baby, though tragically in some cases the baby may not survive. In other cases, tragically, the mother may not survive, whilst the baby does. But the aim should always be to preserve as much life as possible. So you see, an emergency life-saving intervention is very different both in intent and generally in technique from the deliberate and direct destruction of the baby's life inside the womb before extraction. It's worth saying in any emergency situation to take time to intentionally kill the baby in the womb first would not help the life of the mother. That takes longer, more risk of complication, the risk of infection. That is not the way to save the life of a mother, to intentionally kill the child in her womb. Might have to get the child out as quickly as possible, it's never in her health interest to take time to kill the baby in the womb first. To the extent that m many would reject uh, the use of the term abortion altogether to describe this procedure, because abortion is the intentional taking of a life in the womb. 
we're not talking about intentionally taking a life, we're talking about trying to save lives. So these procedures, so emergency interventions where the, the life of the child is, is, is lost, uh, such procedures are generally in this country still listed within the overall abortion statistics. Um, though many of us would say abortion isn't an accurate word to use of such uh, situations when the, when the baby is generally genuinely wanted, um, when the life of the baby is seen as precious, but uh, you can't save both. Um, but anyway, it is they, they are included in the abortion statistics. They account for less than 0.1% of the overall figure. So I hope you can see here that an intervention to do with the life of the mother is vastly different in moral terms from what actually is abortion in the case of rape, in the case of incest, in the case of fetal abnormality. So I hope you can see that when we separate these cases out, um, we can acknowledge, we can agree that extreme cases are emotionally very fraught, but ultimately the attempted justifications connected to them are social reasons, eugenic reasons, hedonistic or utilitarian reasons. And our readiness to accept them, or even just to say, well, we can't be so black and white, we can't be so sure about this. Even just our, um, our contentedness to, to allow it to be grey, it betrays the extent to which we follow the culture in allowing the unborn to be so dehumanised in our thinking. Their value assumed to be less than that of older people. And biblically, such an evaluation simply cannot be supported. As for the case of life of the mother, we should be clear there's a world of moral difference between intentionally taking a life of a baby because it's not wanted or deemed worthy of life and intentional, unintentionally suffering the loss of one life during an attempt to save as many lives as possible. So, so my prayer is, is one day, very soon, the evangelical consensus in this country will move decisively to, to a new point of clarity. We need this urgently. We, we can't be of much use if we don't even know internally what we think about the morality of this. If all lives don't matter, then life doesn't really matter. We've got to be clear on the hard cases or we're not clear on the issue at all. So going back to the quote I shared with you from Ian near the beginning, I'd like it to be uh, adapted to, to this. Of course, there are no situations, for example, rape, incest, fetal abnormality, where we cannot be so black and white. Every life is precious and worthy of defending regardless of circumstances or health. And in emergency medical situations, of course, we work to save as many lives as possible, even if sadly, not all lives can be saved. That's how we need to think about this morally, ethically. And only then can we even begin to properly address the question of whether we should be engaged in the culture and then how we should be engaged in the culture. Because unless we're clear on the morality, it's almost better that we don't engage at all because we'll end up fighting on the wrong side. So it's been one of those weeks when I've just been reminded of the importance Yes, we need to issue the rallying cry, we need to mobilise an army, we need to get out there, we need to get our tactics straight, but we also sadly can't assume that we've even got internal clarity in our own hearts and minds. Our doctrinal clarity, our clarity on the morality of the issue itself is not yet settled because we think it's okay to not be too black and white on the so-called hard cases. And so this, for me, um, it just under underlines and underscores how important it is to be teaching. Where does this lack of clarity come from? It, it's because we're not teaching on this issue. Most churches are not teaching on this issue. Bible colleges are not teaching adequately on this issue. And it's in the silence provides an environment hospitable to confusion and where an offhand, well, of course, we can't be clear on these cases, becomes a sort of an accepted saying within 
conservative evangelicalism in this country. So I want to uh, close by asking you, um, is your church teaching on this? Have you heard clear, thorough biblical teaching on this issue in the last, say, two years? Um, if, if the answer to that is yes, praise the Lord and please help other churches around you uh, to do the same. If the answer is no, um, can I encourage you to get in touch? Um, we are uh, right now um, at this time, we're expanding our Brefos speaker team. Uh, we've got guys all over the country um, who are ready and willing to go into churches to teach on this issue on a Sunday, midweek, whatever, um, to bring the clarity of the light of God's word onto this issue uh, for people in your church. So please, if you're a pastor, get in touch. We'd love to support you. Of course, we'd love to support you to do it yourself. We've got training and resources and whatever you need, um, but we'd also be thrilled to come and do it for you um, with our Brefos speaker team. So whether that's myself or someone else on the team, we'd love to help you. Please be in touch. Um, please don't delay. We need to get clear on this issue and then we need to get active on this issue. Lives hang in the balance. The glory of God is at stake. And this is happening on our watch. And uh, it needs to go down in history to the glory of God one day that it was his people who stood up with moral clarity, moral conviction, and moral courage uh, to see justice done in his name to the glory of God. Um, the end of this great injustice. So stand with us teach with us and um, please do share this with anyone you think might find it helpful thank you for listening and uh, we'll see you again next week